I'm going to be your host this evening. I'm one of the chippy organizers. Uh, yeah, so thanks again for joining us on this very hot Thursday. I was walking outside for like five minutes and just, uh, it was a little ridiculous. Let me just bring up my slides. All right, so before I do start, I just want to make everybody aware of our code of conduct. Uh, anytime you are interacting in a chippy space, be that on the YouTube uh, live chat, be that in a Slack workspace on our Twitter, uh, you have to be respectful of other people. More information is available on our website. Also, uh, what is Chippy? Chippy or the Chicago Python Users Group? It was a it's a group of Python enthusiasts that started meeting in the back of a bar or in small conference rooms back in uh, 2003. And since that time, it's grown to become one of the largest uh, user groups in the world. We have around 6,000 members, and each month we usually hold four to six in-person events. So on top of our main meeting, which happens on the second Thursday of every month, we have special interest groups that focus in on more niche applications of Python. Uh, we have the finance SIG, uh, we have the data SIG, there's a web dev slash DevOps SIG, and we recently started one for algorithms and for data structures. Forgot to delete that slide. So yeah, I just wanted to make uh, some up, uh, announcements of some upcoming virtual events. Uh, next Wednesday, we're gonna have our data special group meeting. And then on the fourth, we're gonna have a web dev slash DevOps meeting. Uh, that one's gonna feature two talks one on Flask and the other on project management. Uh, one of our Chippy community members was working on an open source project to uh, convert a bot from uh, Node to Go. I know it's not a Python story, but it's an awesome DevOps and migration story. I'm really excited for those folks to come on and share it. August 6th is gonna be our next Algo SIG meeting. And then our next main meeting is gonna be on August 13th. Do want to plug our uh, next data SIG. It's gonna be a special night on time series analysis. We have three fantastic speakers. Uh, the first talk is gonna be on Facebook Profit and the time series database InfluxDB. The next talk is gonna be by a Chippy community member, Ray Burr, about using Python Profit in production. And I'm just gonna sort of tease this talk a little bit. We were talking about it on Slack. And he mentioned that the things he's gonna talk about, they're not gonna be things you can learn online or learn by yourself. So looking forward to that. And then finally, our last talk is by Sean Law. Sean Law created a, a time series library called Stumpy. Uh, he's gonna be giving an hour long deep dive into that library, really excited about that. So what else is going on? I don't know if anybody heard, but the Chippy Mentorship Program is back. We're really excited for that. Uh, we actually have a talk. It's going to be our first talk, so we're going to dig into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, one of our Chicago Python community members, uh, Lorena Mesa, she sits on the Python Software Foundation. Uh, she just got nominated. Uh, she just she just got uh, voted in to be the chair, and she's going to be key, uh, keynoting PyCon Africa next month. So uh, we're really proud of her. Just wanted to give her a shout out. Uh, where can you find us? We have a very active Slack community. There's almost 2,000 members. If you go to that URL, you can send yourself an invite and participate in the conversation. We also have a fairly active Twitter. Uh, check us out on uh, at Chicago Python. We're going to be tweeting about things that are happening in Chicago, as well as the wider Python ecosystem. And all this information plus a lot more is going to be on our website, chippy.org. Uh, so tonight is our main meeting. We have three fantastic talks. Our first talk is going to be by Ben and Emily Shell Reiner about the Chippy Mentorship Program and the app they've been working so diligently on. Joel Gruss is going to be talking about 10 different ways to fizz buzz. You can't believe number three. Sorry, Joel, I had to do a little bit of a little bit of clickbait there. And then finally, we have Paco Nathan diving deep into AutoML with an hour-long talk. So really excited about that and to sort of find out what the whole buzz is all about. Uh, so we do have a live chat feature. So if you look to my left or right, can't really know, it's going to be that way. 
Uh, you can interact with our folks. Uh, just know there's going to be a 10 to 20 second delay. So if you do have questions, get them in ahead of time and we can queue them up for the speakers. Is that it for slides? Yeah, I think it is. Cool. So I am just going to bring on our first speakers. Welcome, Emily and Ben, to the Chicago Python live stream. Hey. Hi. Thank you. Uh, so uh, could you please introduce yourself to our community? Emily, could you please start first? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So um, I am a Python enthusiast. I studied computer science in college and then have actually, since graduating, worked in the finance industry for six years. And I've recently been getting back into Python and programming in general with the help of the Chippy community. So uh, thank you and nice to talk. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think like Chicago is sort of that finance hub and everybody sort of works in that industry one time or another. Uh, ben, how about you? Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, so I am a developer. I'm working in Chicago at Active Campaign, and I've been coding in Python for at least nine years and been using it professionally for about six. Awesome. Yeah, shout out to Active Campaign, a chippy sponsor. So how, do, how did you get into Python? Ben, can you please start? Sure. So, um, I had, uh, I'd say I had a small amount of experience in coding before I came into college, but I didn't know Python then. In college, I uh, started a major in computer science and just kind of picked up Python because of how clean the syntax was and how great the ecosystem of libraries around it was. Cool. And Emily, how about, uh, how about you? Honestly, it's the same story. Um, I was taking a class with Ben in college and we got to choose our language and he was like, we should use Python. And that was the beginning. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of our community members have been uh, sort of dealing with sheltering in place. Would you be able to talk about like your experience and how you've been like, I've been channeling my energy. I'm sure you can see like through this YouTube, like every single time there's like something new in my setup. Like how have you been handling uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, so we're really lucky in that, I mean, I think this is true for a lot of programmers um, too, so we, we can work from home. So it's been a bit of an adjustment, but otherwise it's been great. We've gotten really into quarantine hobbies. Um, ben runs and bakes bread, and I play the piano and do logic puzzles. And we also got a cat in February, which was just really amazing timing, so. Awesome, so what's, what's the cat's name? Uh, oh dear Lord. Um, so the short answer is eternity, but we keep adding on to it. Okay. And more aspects of her personality become clear. So it's about seven or eight names long now, I think. Okay. Well, we actually do have a pet of Chippy channel. So I'd love to have you share pictures of uh, eternity. I think we need to do that. We've got some great pictures. Fantastic. Yeah. Are you, are you all ready to start your talk? Yeah. So um, let me just uh, get this screen up and uh, please take it away. Great. So we're here to talk about the Chippy Mentorship app, as we've said. So what is the Chippy Mentorship app? Um, so to understand this, it is helpful to have a brief history of Chippy Mentorship and we'll keep it brief. Uh, so from 2014 to 2019, Chippy ran what we'll call the old mentorship program. This was a really structured program that would pair up individual mentees with individual mentors, and the mentees would work on a project with the help of the mentor. They would blog about the experience, and uh, the whole cohort of mentors and mentees would do project night workshops together. It was really great. Um, ben was a mentor twice. I was a mentee, and we both got a lot out of this experience. Um, so the program did have some weaknesses. In particular, it was kind of capacity limited. It requires 13 weeks of commitment from mentors and mentees. You can only join twice a year. And so at the end of the year, last year, um, Chippy made the decision to discontinue the old mentorship program in favor of two other offerings. So the first one is apprenticeship type offerings. And I think the best example of this one is the Web Guild. Um, where less experienced Python programmers and more experienced Python programmers can work alongside each other on a real project that people use um, for the web guild. That's actually chippy.org. So you have probably used it. Um, and the second offering is for people who really like the one-on-one -on -one aspect of mentoring and um, wanted to be able to focus on specific skills. And it was that we were going to create an app to connect people so that they could organize their own mentorship relationships. So talking about what the app does, 
Um, what do you need to self-organize a mentorship relationship? Um, you need to be able to find someone who has the skills and experiences you're interested in. So we built in a search feature um, and you need to find someone who also wants to be a mentor. So, um, and you need to tell them who you are and what they're looking for. And you need to be able to ask them to mentor you. So that's pretty much what the app helps you do. Uh, ben can talk about what we built. Right, so before we talk about uh, exactly all the technology involved here, I wanted to shout out to everybody who has contributed so far. So Zax, you probably know him, he ran the mentorship program before this, and he's been the project manager on uh, for this project. Uh, Ray has been a helpful advisor throughout the whole thing. And in terms of developers, there's me, Emily, Heather, Fazel, and Ali have all contributed code. And I wanted to make a special shout out to Josh, who's been our first contributor after the launch of the app to get a, a pull request merged. So we're using GitHub to submit pull requests and to uh, create tickets and to plan out our sprints using their projects feature. We're using GitHub Actions to run our test suites before we allow pull requests to get merged. And in the future, we'd also like to use that to run our deployments. So at the end of the sprint, we ship our code over to Heroku, which is running our servers in production. Um, and then uh, all the data is being stored in production in Postgres, and we're using Django as, as the web server. Uh, most of the front end has been styled using Bootstrap. And uh, two other important tools, we're using OAuth to create new users and log them in on GitHub and we're using SendGrid to send email notifications out to our users. So when you first sign up, you're gonna be asked some questions, fill out a biography and uh, add some skills. So here's the profile page of me after I have filled out some information. So in this box, you can see uh, the biography that I've added and there's an edit button where you can change it. Below it, you can see my skills. So there's want help and can help in both boxes you can add skills and rate yourself on a one to five scale. You can edit them with those edit skill buttons. The important part about want help and can help is that can help are skills that you can help in. So putting skills here helps people looking for a mentor find people with the skills they're looking to be helped with to improve on. And then want help is the opposite. If you are a mentor uh, and you, or if you're a mentee and you and you maybe want mentors to come and find you, you can put things there and they can search you through there. So in this view, we're on the search page and I should start by mentioning, now we're logged in as Emily. So Emily is looking for a mentor and there's a search box here where she can type in her search term. So in this case, she's looking for help building a mentorship website. There's a radio button. So like I mentioned earlier, you can search for mentors or mentees. After you search, you get a listing of results. The search box will search based on name, the bio, and the skills. Um, and then from there, you can go ahead and click on, on the mentor, and you'll come see their profile. So you'll notice this looks mostly the same as, as the uh, profile page when we were logged in as me. But now we're logged in as Emily, and we see a new section where we can request uh, Ben to become our mentor. So if we can go ahead and uh, click on that and we'll see a box pop up where we can send a message to him if we decide that we want him to be our mentor. Uh, you should take some time, fill this out uh, with something thoughtful, explain what you're looking for, maybe like what kind of commitment in terms of the mentorship program you're looking for, and then go ahead and submit your request. After you do that, Ben is gonna get an email immediately that you've made the request and you can look at your request page to see all the requests that you've been sent or received. And you can see right now on the right-hand side there, we have, a pending to, we have a pending request over to Ben. So Ben gets that email, he gets a link to Emily's user profile and a link to this request. So this is the view that Ben will see when he clicks on that request. And from here, we can see the I can see the message that Emily sent me and I can choose to accept or reject uh, or actually ignore the request. So if I accept it, uh, this is Emily's view again. She'll see that I've accepted in her view. And she'll also get an email that I have accepted her request. And she'll get my contact information. And I will have her contact information at this point as well. And we can start uh, setting up appointments to meet together. And that is pretty much where the flow of this app ends. 
And now that we sort of talked to you through what the app looks like, um, just thought we'd share some of the exciting tools that we used in the process. Um, the first one is Django has built in um, Postgres's full text search library, and it does some pretty cool things. So like one of the things it does is it normalizes lexemes, which is linguistic speaks for understanding the roots of words in English. So for example, if you say, I want to learn how to program and you search for program, um, it's also going to recognize if someone has in their bio, I am a programmer, or I love programming, or I write programs. Um, so that's really a lot smarter than I think something we could write quickly. And then the other thing that it gives you that's really um, nice is that it gives you an easy way to rank search results by relevance. So that's what we use when uh, you search for a mentor. It shows you the most relevant mentors up front. Um, and another tool we used is the Social Auth Django plugin, which let us pretty easily use another service. In this case, it's GitHub uh, to create users. It lets us decide the scope of what we want uh, from the other service and how we use that information in user creation. Um, and then the third thing that we really liked was GitHub Actions, which gave us a really simple continuous integration experience. Uh, so we set it up so that as soon as anyone submits a pull request, it runs our full test suite, and it'll only allow people to merge if the tests all pass. Uh, and we're looking into using GitHub Actions for our deployment as well. Uh, so if you are paying attention to Chippy Slack over the weekend, you'll have noticed a few announcements, um, and also uh, Ali just mentioned it now uh, about us launching the app. And if you're like me, you haven't really had that many chances to really launch an app and then have people immediately use it day one. So we thought that that would be an interesting experience to talk about and how we approached it. So the first thing we did in terms of launching the app was actually on May 24th, so a while ago now. And at the time, the chippymentor.org domain, which we were using, uh, was pointing at the old Chippy Mentorship Program website. Uh, so with the uh, sage advice of Ray Berg, we uh, dropped all the tables and uh, put in, uh, deployed our current app, and we did that in maintenance mode. So um, if, if you navigated anywhere on the chippymentor.org domain, it would show you our homepage, except with a giant coming soon banner on top of it. And then we told everyone that we were going to launch on July 4th, and that was actually a lie. Uh, we launched on July 3rd silently, uh, made sure everything was in pretty good working order. And then by July 4th, we were ready to announce it to the world that we had launched. And the great thing was, <laughs> the great thing was that people did immediately start using the app. Um, people created accounts, sent a few requests. And the other thing people did was they said, hey, this isn't working. Um, can you please fix this? So we spent our weekend uh, hitting up the most critical bug fixes. And after that, we moved to preparing this talk. And here we are today. Uh, so far, uh, Ben, do you want to talk about the stats that we've got? Sure. So, so far, uh, and this is as of yesterday. Uh, so there might be some more right now. We have 39 users. We have, 30, or we have 31 users who have filled out their profile. We've already had nine uh, mentorship requests and four of them accepted. And we have 27 tickets in GitHub, so some work to do. So, so what's next um, now that we've launched? Well, first, everyone who is inter interested in mentorship, you should use the app. Um, as we said, you can sign up using your GitHub account at chippymentor.org. There's also a link on the chippy.org homepage to the mentorship app if you can't remember chippymentor.org. Um, and then once you've signed up, you should fill out your profile with your bio and your skills so that people can find you and understand what you're there for. And then you can search for mentors or mentees. And when you find one you like, you can send them a request. If they're interested in working with you, you can get their contact information and you can start organizing meetups. Um, and what those meetups look like and how many there are is really up to you. You can meet as many or as few times as you want. Just remember, uh, these mentorship relationships fall under the Chippy Code of Conduct, so please be a decent human being. So if you've been watching this and you think you might want to help us out with coding the app, um, we, we host meetings on Slack. 
in the Buddy Mentorship Group every Thursdays at 6.30 p.m., except for when there's a main meeting like today. We host all of our code and organize our project on GitHub in the Chicago Python organization. There you can flag issues, fix bugs, help us write documentation, and of course, write new code and new features. Um, so who are we looking for? We're looking for anyone who wants to help with an ongoing open source project. We have a lot of design work to do on the front end. Uh, so if you go to CSS, that would be a great help. And we have lots of continued feature work to do on Django. Um, so before I finish up here, I want to mention that uh, if you have any questions, start typing them in the live comments channel now. Uh, so what will we be working on next? Uh, so, so some of the new features that we're working on are the ability to manage the availability of your profile. So say you've started a mentorship program and you've reached capacity. You can't um, you can't mentor any more people at this time. Either that would be a switch you could flip to turn off your profile until you are ready to take on new mentees. In app notifications, in addition to those blog, so that mentees can showcase the great work that they're doing, uh, any projects that they've completed or are currently working on, and better searching capabilities, so that we can help match mentors and mentees up based on their schedule and and physical location, so that they're they can meet up more easily. Uh, we're working on redesigning the front end, improving our testing infrastructure, and of course fixing any bugs that come up. So with that, um, we're on to the Q and A. Awesome. That was great. Can everybody give Ben and Emily a round of applause? Like you put so much hard work into it and it's like, it really shows like the website is fantastic. So yeah, if you do have questions, please ask them in the, the, the live, uh, the chat window on the left. Uh, I actually do have some questions. So, uh, what have you learned working on this project? You want to take that Emily? Yeah, so um, I mean, we both definitely took different things from it because Ben is working as a professional web developer as a while for a while, and I never have. So um, it was really interesting to sort of for me understand how you collaborate with others on a system like GitHub, how you manage issues, and sort of who does what, and sort of how you review and test your code. Um, but also it was just really fun to immerse yourself in or Im immerse ourselves in Django and just sort of it's a pretty deep framework and it gives you a lot of things for free. And it's always exciting to sort of think about something and go, oh, my God, I have to write a search algorithm. And then you'll be like, actually, no, not at all. We just had that. So that, that's what I got out of it. Yeah, I absolutely yeah. love Django for that. Uh, ben, how about you? What, what have you learned? It was it was also my first time using Django, so it was cool to learn how to do things the Django way. Um, and I think I also it was my first time working uh, on a community project like this, so um, the skills involved there was, was definitely new. Yeah, just a shout out to Zax for uh, all that fantastic project manager work, well, work he did. Like yeah. I just remember seeing those tickets just being cranked out. Like the man is a machine. Yeah. Uh, but like uh, while we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, what are some of your favorite features of Django? Uh, Emily, do you want to start? Yeah. So um, th this is a super basic part of it, but I really like the class-based views idea in general. Uh, they were sometimes kind of hard to debug if you don't really know what you're looking for. But just being able to write something and then have um, like the models automatically f flow through and to be able to just have a pagination feature built in and to sort of extend these classes and make them do what you want um, is really nice and pretty easy. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, and I think in addition to all the built-in stuff, the, just the ecosystem around like setting up the user creation through GitHub, it's just a plugin you install and it's up and working. Yeah, it is absolutely fantastic. Like I've been, uh, so I've been working on the Chippy Slack bot, which is like written in Flask, and I'm like looking at all my imports. Everything I'm importing is like built into Django, so I don't really know if I made the right decision, but like live and learn, right? <laughs> Uh, so uh, I think uh, just before we do let you go, do you have any uh, calls to actions? How can people uh, start getting uh, signed up to become either a mentor or a mentee? Yeah, so um, like I think we walked through um, how to do it. You go to the chippymentor.org or chippy.org and click mentorship. And from there, if you hit login, you get redirected to um, 
to GitHub where you authorize GitHub to log you in and then you'll have a user account created and you're ready to go. And if you don't awesome. have a GitHub account, you should create one. It'll be really helpful for you. Yeah. Yeah. Right now you need a GitHub account. We're working on uh, one of the features in the future will be uh, just email based logins as well. Okay. Yeah. I guess I do have one question when you, um, is there any tech debt item that you like sort of like thinking back, you're like, I can't believe I did it this way, but I have to get this project out. So like, we'll just leave it in there. Yeah, there is some jQuery I put in there that I really would prefer it to be React. So that that would be the piece. Awesome. So I feel like there's an open issue. So if anybody wants to learn some React and help out, uh, uh, I think we are looking for some help. So thanks again. And can we get another round of applause in the chat for uh, Ben and Emily? All right. Thanks again. Uh, so. Uh, Next up, we're going to have uh, Joel. I'm just going to bring him on to the live stream. Welcome, Joel, to the Chicago Python live stream. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Uh, can you please introduce yourself to our community? Yeah. So my name is Joel. Um, I live in Seattle. Well, I live near Seattle. I'm pretty active in Puppy, which is the Puget Sound Python meetup. Um, I work at a company called Capital Group, which is an investment firm where I lead a small team that builds machine learning and data products. Um, before I joined Capital Group, I was at an organization called the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. It's an AI research nonprofit, and I worked on a library called Allen NLP, which is basically a deep learning library for NLP researchers. Uh, before that, I was at Google for a couple of years doing pretty boring software engineering stuff. Um, and then before that, I, I was in data science at a bunch of startups. So Awesome. And I also just want to give a shout out. You're also a YouTuber. I've been uh, watching your Advent of Code YouTubes like after I finished the problem to sort of see how you do it. I really enjoy how you walk through those. So thanks for that. Yeah, it's fun and, and frustrating sometimes. Yeah, oh, definitely. I, I think we've all been there. Uh, so can you please uh, talk about how you first got into Python? Yeah, so probably about 15 years ago, I was in grad school um, and I took a class called Probability Modeling. Um, and it was based in MATLAB. But the site license that they had for MATLAB, you could only use it on campus. And I like to do work at home, not on campus. Um, and so I discovered that uh, there was a library in Python. Uh, at the time, it was actually called Numeric. That was before they changed the name to NumPy or merged it with NumPy. Um, and that I could basically do the equivalent of what I was supposed to do in MATLAB using that and not have to have a license and, and be able to work out of my apartment instead of on campus. Um, so that was like my first dipping my toe in Python. Then I sort of put it aside and did mostly Excel and SQL for about five years. And then in around 2010 or 2011, I kind of got back into using Python as part of my everyday work. Awesome. So uh, are you still, would you still consider yourself like an Excel master? I feel like those skills never go away. Um, that's a great question. I, I, I really haven't used Excel seriously in about 10 years, but I'm probably still pretty good at it. Awesome. Uh, so a lot of folks have been uh, sheltering in place. Uh, people have been feeling isolated, lonely. They've been channeling their energies different ways. So how have you been, uh, what have you been doing during COVID? Um, well, you know, I have gotten back two to three hours a day by not having to commute, which is nice. Um, and I kind of like working from home. So it's been easy for me in that way. Um, and, you know, I, I took the opportunity to uh, finish up a book that I had started and uh, that was not really going anywhere. So, um, and I've also gotten my yard in order. Uh, which is something that's been a real sore point for years. So, yeah, I feel like I've seen yard before and after transformation picks all over the internet right now. Great. So, are you are you ready to get started with your talk? I am ready. Awesome. Do you want to share your screen? Let me do that. All right. So, um, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Joel, I was already introduced, and I'm going to talk about 10 ways to fizz buzz. Um, so, um, other, apart from my introduction about where I've worked, um, I, I wrote this book called 10 Essays on Fizz Buzz, which just came out, which is what I'm talking about tonight. Um, you may also know me or know of me as the person who does not like notebooks and gave a talk about it at JupyterCon. Um, and I also wrote a book called Data Science from Scratch, which is an O'Reilly book, and it, it's pretty good. So, um, these are some of my various claims to fame or infamy. Um, and, and so I'm going to assume that most of you are probably familiar with the problem FizzBuzz, but in case you're not, it's the following problem. Print the numbers 1 to 100, except that if the number is divisible by 3, instead of printing the number, you print Fizz. 
Um, if the number is divisible by five, instead of printing the number, you print buzz. If the number is divisible by 15, instead of printing the number, you print fizz buzz. And so you know, this is sometimes used in interviews as kind of a lowest common denominator filtering question to, to ask, can you write code at all? And, and so it, it sort of gained this legend as this is the stereotypical bad question to ask during an interview. Um, and, and so like, why do I care about this problem? Well, about four years ago, I wrote uh, a blog post uh, called FizzBuzz and TensorFlow uh, that was the story of someone who went on a job interview and got a little bit insulted that he was being asked to solve FizzBuzz. And so he decided to solve it using deep learning and kind of show up as interviewer. Um, and so ever since then, um, I've been kind of seen as a, a thought leader in the FizzBuzz space uh, for whatever for whatever that's worth. Um, and so, you know, some people associate me with FizzBuzz, um, and sometimes people tweet about me, hey, you should write a book about FizzBuzz because people like this topic of FizzBuzz. Um, and so then, you know, we got quarantined, and so I did. Um, of course, this uh, tweet asked me to write a book about 100 ways of writing FizzBuzz, um, but, but 100 is a lot. Um, and I'm not sure I could have come up with 100 different ways to solve FizzBuzz, or if I did, they would not have, a lot of them wouldn't have been very interesting. Um, but I was able to come up with 10 that were actually pretty good. Um, and what I did is I used each one as sort of the basis of an essay to talk about Python or coding or mathematics or software engineering or design or computer science or so on. So that even though uh, you know the book is on one hand about these problems, it also uh, gives me a chance to sort of wax philosophical about you know a lot of these topics. And in this talk, I don't really have time to go into the details. Um, and also I want to like tempt you to read the book. So I'm going to talk about the 10 solutions, or I'm gonna introduce you to the 10 solutions themselves without necessarily going on long digressions about each one. And hopefully you'll, uh, you'll want to know more. And so, you know, can I come up with 10 solutions that are interesting? Uh, I like to think that I did, uh, but you be the judge. And so just, you know, just to remind you, uh, this is the problem. Print the numbers 1 to 100, except it's divisible by 3, print fizz. If it's divisible by 5, print buzz. And if it's divisible by 15, print fizz buzz. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and we're going to solve it 10 different ways. Okay, so, you know, the first way is uh, with 100 print statements. This is this is a solution. Um, in a lot of ways, it's not a good solution, uh, but this solves the problem as stated. Um, it does what the interviewer asked you to do. Um, and you know, if nothing else, it, it it sort of shows the interviewer what you think of them and what you think of that problem. And you should never underestimate uh, the value of that. But there's nothing really surprising going on here, um, unless you're surprised that this was one of the solutions. Um, the second solution is what I call the if, elif, elif, else solution. This is kind of the canonical solution. Um, and this is probably the sort of solution that your interviewer is looking for. Uh, check if things are divisible by 15, then check five, then check three. Um, there are a few things not to like about this solution. One is that it's kind of order sensitive. So if you don't check the mod 15 first, uh, you'll get it wrong. Um, it also requires you to know the modulus operator. Some people object to it on those grounds, thinking that many, you know, you could be an advanced programmer and not know the modulus operator. Um, and then some people just don't like the four branched if else, 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 which they find distasteful or unesthetic or something. But th this is, you know, this is the solution that your interviewer probably would be expecting. Um, you know, but if you do know the modulus operator and you start thinking about the problem in terms of modular arithmetic, um, you know, you may start to appreciate that there's a deeper mathematical structure that underlies uh, this problem. Um, and so this is what I call the cycle of 15 solution. Um, and what I like about it is that it starts to hint at that underlying structure of the problem. And, and if you look at it, it might take you a second to figure out what's going on here, but we have uh, basically a list of 15 things and we mod n by 15 and then just take the, the relevant entry in the list. So, so this is, Maybe a slightly unusual solution. Um, it's not super complex, but it's uh, it hints at something more going on here, which which I like. Um, this one I call Euclid solution. Um, if you like number theory, this might be the solution for you. Um, and this one is a little bit more subtle. Um, this one is actually one of my favorites in the book. Um, I find it extremely elegant, and if I if you look at it. Um, 
you may not see what's going on because it's not obvious what's going on, but but I think it is an elegant solution and and, and I and I really enjoy it a lot. Um, and, and when you do like dig in to see why this works, it, it it's actually quite quite nice. And so uh, I like this one. I'm proud of it. Um, you know, you may have studied trigonometry in high school. Um, and if you did, you probably wondered, what is trigonometry ever going to be useful for? And it turns out that one of the things that trigonometry is useful for is for solving FISBAs. Here's a FISBA solution that uses math.cosine uh, to solve it. Um, and, and, and so that's pretty interesting and a little bit unexpected. But again, it hints at some of this deeper structure that underlies the problem. Um, and also, as, as a person of taste, I, I use math.tau instead of math.py because because uh, that's what I like to do. Um, so, so this one is uh, this is a good one too. This is my big number solution. So this one is probably uh, the most opaque. Um, that's a big number written in hexadecimal, and then we pick it apart with a regex and convert it to labels and it's probably not at all obvious what's going on there, but um, you know it, it's a good opportunity for me to um, get to write an essay about hexadecimal numbers and Huffman codes and, and things like that. So um, this one, I don't want to say this one's elegant because I don't really find it that elegant. It's a little bit ugly, but there are some pretty interesting things going on behind the scenes, um, and, and so I like it uh, from that perspective. This uh, this is another one of my favorites. This might be my my favorite overall. It's extremely elegant. There's no threes. There's no fives. There's no fifteens. All there is is iter tools and lists. And like I love iter tools. I, I'm like one of the biggest iter tools fans there is. And, and so this um, again, this is this is another solution that really speaks to some of the deeper structure that underlies the FISBUS problem. And yes, I know it sounds silly to talk about, you know, that this joke problem is having this deeper structure underneath it. Um, but to me, this is possibly my favorite of all the solutions because there's something that's very clean and kind of uh, pure about it. And uh, I also like that it basically generates every FISBUS number going off to infinity, which, which is also um, a side benefit. So this one, is possibly the most surprising. Um, so this is the random guessing solution. And you can see that we have uh, some loops there, but the key element is these calls to random.choice, which if you're familiar with Python's random mo module, is basically um, picking a random element of that list. Um, and so you might be thinking, how does picking a random element of a list get me the right solutions to FISBAs? Um, and again, the answer to that involves a combination of the underlying structure of the problem, as well as an understanding of how Python's random module really works and what it's, what's actually happening when you call random.choice. So this, uh, it doesn't look neat and you know, clean on the page necessarily, but still like, it, it's a very surprising result. Um, and, and I promise all these work, like these, these are not like fake ones that don't work. These, these really do work. Um, and, and so I like, uh, I like this one a lot because it, it it's really kind of a, a, a surprising result uh, if you don't uh, if you haven't kind of taken it apart and, and understand how it works. You know the, the the ninth solution is the matrix multiplication solution. Matrix multiplication is pretty popular these days, so I wanted to get a solution in that involves matrix multiplications. Here we're using NumPy because NumPy is the way to do matrix multiplication. Um, and here I just have a weights matrix that I multiply by some feature matrix and you know, take the argmax and that gives me FISBAs. And so um, I'm not sure if this one's surprising or not. Uh, I, I like this one too. I think it's kind of neat and clean. Um, and it really sets the stage um, or sets the table for the 10th solution, uh, which is my FISBAs and TensorFlow solution, like the blog post. And there's a sick there. And the sick is that, um, I don't work in TensorFlow, I work in PyTorch. Uh, the original blog post was written in TensorFlow because when I wrote it, uh, PyTorch didn't exist, so that was the only thing to work with. But these days, I don't even really know how to do TensorFlow. I only know how to do PyTorch. So um, I called it FizzBuzz and TensorFlow because that's what the blog post was called. But
but it's really a PyTorch solution. Um, and here, it's not, uh, it's not a neat solution that's going to print out the answer, but I can show you how I modeled the problem and, and how I approached it. And that will give you a sense of how I think about approaching machine learning problems. Um, and so you know, I needed to come up with a data model. Um, I mentioned before that I'm like a huge fan of iter tools. I'm also uh, like probably the world's biggest fan of named tuples. I use them everywhere for everything as much as I can. Um, and so if I'm doing a machine learning uh, project like this, you will most likely find me using some kind of name tuple for my instances. Here I have an instance which is represents some number. You know, it could be the number 15. It has some tensor of features, which is what we're going to feed into our neural network. And it has a label indicating what class is this going to be in. Is it, you know, as is fizz buzz or fizz buzz? So this is kind of the data model setup. Um, I also wrote a function to evaluate a model. Um, this is not very exciting. This is basically just saying, take the model, take some data, make predictions, count how many are right, and maybe print them out. Um, so this is, uh, I included it here for completeness, but it's not very exciting and it's not necessarily relevant to solving the problem. Um, in terms of constructing the data, you know, I, I talk about a couple different ways that you might want to get features out of these numbers for modeling. The one that I found that works best is actually to use the binary digits. So I, I can represent all numbers up to 1,024 with 10 binary digits. So that's what I do. Um, and then so that I'm doing, you know, good machine learning discipline, I train my model on the binary digits for 101 up to 1024. And I test the model on 1 to 101, which is what I want to predict. Um, so that's how I set up the data. Um, and then finally, you know, I set up a model that's basically uh, a neural network with a linear layer and a ReLU layer and then another linear layer. Um, I treat the problem as a four class classification problem, again, where I have an as is class, a fizz class, a buzz class, and a fizz buzz class. And I use cross entropy loss to try and, uh, you know, make the right predictions. Um, and then I just train it for you know, 2,500 epochs or whatever. Um, and it turns out that if I do this, um, I can get a model that works pretty well. Um, it, I, I have in the past managed to get a model that gets 100 out of 100 correct. Usually, usually it doesn't. Um, and you have to really, it's very sensitive to the hyperparameters. Um, but you can get a model that gets about 90 out of 100 correct pretty easily. Um, and then, you know, one thing that's actually really interesting, um, and again, <laughs> speaks to the deeper structure of how the FizzBuzz problem works, as well as how binary representations of numbers work, is to really dig in and say, like, how does this model get it right? How does it learn to predict the right divisible by three or divisible by five or divisible by 15 from 10 binary digits? Which, if you think about it, it's not obvious, given 10 binary digits, how do I tell if something's divisible by three or by five or by 15? And so the way the model manages to learn that is actually, um, pretty interesting and I, I won't spoil it for you. Um, and also it would take me a long time to explain, but it is pretty interesting. Um, so that's the that's the tenth way. Um, and uh, you know, I, I hope you'll agree that those 10 ways were all actually pretty interesting. Um, and, I, and I wanna thank you again for having me uh, come here. If I have, you know, intrigued you and you wanna check out the book, um, if you use this link, fizzbuzzbook.com slash C slash chippy, the C is for coupon, then if you click on that link, it's it's a lean pub book, so it you can get a cheaper discount if you go there. Or if you just want to see the solutions, which is what I showed you, um, those are on GitHub, um, my name slash fizzbuzz, and you see those for free all you want. Um, don't forget about data science from scratch. The second edition is very, very good. Uh, I'm proud of it. It came out about a year ago. Um, you can find me on Twitter. My name at Joel Gruce. I'll tweet out these slides uh, once I'm done talking. And I have a blog at joelgruce.com that I very rarely update, like maybe once a year. So that's uh, that's what I have to say about FizzBuzz for now. So th uh, thank you again. Thank you for coming. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joel. Can we give Joel a round of applause in the chat? Uh, so do, uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, uh, you do love named tuples. What's your opinion on data classes? So um, I'm not a huge fan of data classes for two reasons. Um, one is that I like immutability, and uh, named tuples give me immutability, and data classes don't. And I find that it's very rare that I actually need to use immutable data structures. And so um, I'm happier when I use immutable ones. The other is that 
name tuples are actually a really nice compact represent representation, whereas data classes are actually sugar around like classes. And so, um, you know, a lot of the times it doesn't matter, but uh, actually in Allen NLP, we were creating these token objects. And with like a large data set, you'd be creating millions of these token objects. And it was taking up so much memory when they were classes. And then we switched them to name tuples and suddenly the memory consumption shot way down because it had these compact representations. So I just, I, I tend to prefer them. Yeah, for sure. I, I just recently learned about the class type versus just like the one from like the collections library. And yeah. like we can, like you can add functions to it and like totally, total game changer. Uh, I think while we're still waiting for some questions to come in, uh, is there a favorite method out of the 10 that you sort of like liked sort of uh, figuring out? Um, the So the one about the infinite iterables with the, the iter tool cycle, that one when it, um, so I, like I said, I love iter tools and I love thinking about interesting ways to use iter tools. And so that one I was just kind of thinking about Whenever I see a Python problem, I always ask myself, is there a way I can use iter tools with this somehow? <laughs> um, and, and so that that was, you know, that was the same thing. I asked myself, can I use iter tools with this somehow? Um, and when when I figured that out, it was it was very satisfying. Um, the other one that, that I think really I enjoyed was the, the Euclid solution because um, when you dig into it and understand what it's doing and why it works, it, it's actually super interesting. Um, Awesome. Uh, so well, do you have any calls to actions for the community? I guess besides uh, use more inner tools? Um, you, you know, use inner tools, uh, use name tuples. I like them a lot. Um, you know, uh, check out the book and, and buy it if you're so inclined. Um, that's a call to action. Um, and, you know, just so here's the thing. FizzBuzz on some level is like kind of like a, a, a toy little problem, but there's actually a lot of like really interesting stuff that, that came out of thinking about it in, in kind of a serious way and trying to unpack it and trying to approach it from all these different angles. Um, and, and I think that's probably true in a lot more cases. There are a lot of problems that maybe seem simple on the surface, but when you start thinking about how can I approach this in a lot of different ways, um, there's actually some really interesting angles to it and some really interesting things you can learn about you know either Python or about the problem or about math or, or, or so on. So. Yeah, that's great. Digging into things is by far the best way to learn them. Uh, just so before we do let you go, is there like one thing that sort of sticks out at the top of your mind that you learned from this particular project? Um, one thing that sticks out. No, uh, I mean, so I've spent, I spent a lot of the past, call it five years, thinking about how do I, how do I use code to illustrate concepts, right? How do I use code to like teach things and show ideas? And so that's everything from like, how should I name my variables to how should I split things into functions? Um, and, and so, you know, re working on this book sort of reinforced for me a lot of this, that um, it really makes a huge difference from a pedagogical perspective, you know, having a function with bad variable names and having a function with good variable names and having a function that it's clear what it does versus having a function that it's not clear what it does. Um, and so, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about those kinds of issues and, and, I, and I feel like this kind of reiterated to me that uh, it, it pays off when you approach that the right way. I think that's a fantastic place to leave it, like software, pra software design best practices, software engineering best practices. Well, thanks again, Joel, for being on the Chippy live stream. And uh, we will also just a link to your book so people can go find it with the coupon code. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank All you right. so much. So that was Joel Bruce talking about 10 different ways to fizzbuzz. Before that, we had Emily and Ben Shia Reinert talking about the just recently launched Chippy Buddy Mentorship app. Uh, we're actually going to take a short break uh, before we have our next speaker, Paco Nathan talk about an introduction to auto ML. So stay tuned.
All right, and we're back. So thanks everybody for joining the Chicago Python main meeting. Uh, we just had our first two speakers present. Uh, next up, we're gonna have uh, Paco and Nathan come on the live stream. But before I do bring them on, if you're still here, you're having a good time, go down below and hit that like button. Also subscribe to our channel, uh, get notified of upcoming events by hitting that bell icon. All right, so Paco, welcome to the Chicago Python live stream. Hi, Ali. Great. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, uh, are you joining us from uh, San Francisco? No, um, I I live uh, way out in the woods. I live like uh, a couple hours north uh, out in the redwoods. Okay, awesome. Oh uh, yeah, could you uh, please introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Um, yeah, my name is Paco Nathan. Um, I've been doing machine learning work for a long time, and my hair is getting kind of gray. Um, let's see, what else can I say? Um, I made the mistake of studying AI in grad school in the early 80s, and everybody said it was kind of a mistake, and I guess the timing was bad. But, um, you know, it's really good to, like, stick with something you really love, because after about maybe 30 or 40 years, it might become super useful. Uh, so <laughs> that, that's kind of, like, the history of my career. Yeah, just, just stay stubborn enough. Hopefully things will work out. Exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So could you all please talk about like how your, your experience and how you first got into Python? Sure. Yeah. Um, I was leading data teams. Uh, you know, I, I started working in Python in like 2008 uh, with a data science team that I was leading at a large ad network. Um, and then the next company I was at, there was a really large project in Java. And there had been two engineers um, who'd worked for about six months and spent a lot of money. And they'd written about 3,000 lines of Java uh, to do this one particular system. Um, and it didn't really work very well. And my boss got annoyed and told me to like shut it down. Um, and, and these were really good engineers. In fact, in fact, one of them became my boss at a couple companies later. Um, but we had to go in and rewrite it. And it turned out we rewrote that whole 3,000 line system in about 87 lines of Python in two and a half days. And it ran better and it handled the edge cases more gracefully. And by almost every possible software engineering metric, that was a much better way to do things. So, you know, I, I've been around a lot of projects and a lot of people who are uh, more gray and older than me who believe that if you're not Java, you're not anything, you know? But yet I was like, this is serious software engineering. You can really get a lot of amazing things done. So since then, mostly I do Python, a couple other languages too, but mostly that. Awesome, yeah, it's like a very awesome, a very easy language to uh, to communicate in. Uh, people know what's going on, feels like pseudocode. So a lot yeah. of folks, so yeah, oh, so a lot of folks, go ahead. Oh yeah, it's a really interesting point about pseudocode. Yeah. Alan Downey is an author that writes about Python. Yeah. And there's a really great talk that I, I saw at Food Camp one time. Um, Alan was showing how pseudocode in scientific papers, actually the Python implementation of the algorithm, how it was more succinct than the pseudocode in the paper, which when you stop and think about it, is kind of mind blowing. I guess like with list comprehensions, like everything's just like magic. Yeah, so we uh, so our last speaker spent uh, their time during COVID writing a book. How have you been handling uh, sheltering in place? <laughs> well, um, I, I, I've been working remote for a while, and um, I've also been working on conferences and especially um, remote learning. Uh, so it's kind of weird because I pitched a company about a year ago, and the VCs were like, "Yeah, maybe," and then. They were like, I don't know if people are really going to be into like remote work and stuff. Um, <laughs> so, so actually, it's gotten a lot busier. Um, it's really quiet out here in the woods. We live in a small town of about 7,000 people, although my brother lives downtown in Chicago. So, I mean, I'm here in both sides of the story. Awesome. So uh, are you ready to go with your, uh, with your talk? Yeah, great. Perfect. If you can just share your screen, we'll get it on the live stream. OK, excellent. And um, I'll share. I'll share the entire screen. Okay, and there start. Alrighty, can you see me? Okay, there. Uh yeah, we see the full screen. Do you mind just hitting the the hide button? Yeah, perfect. Awesome, Paco. Please take it away. Okay, great. Um, I think that took away your. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. There we go. Great. 
Um, alrighty, uh, this talk is introducing AutoML, and AutoML is a really fascinating topic area. Um, there's certainly a lot of commercial products that sort of speak to this, and we'll dive into that, but there's also a lot of open source. So um, some of the history, um, I, I guess about a year and a half ago, uh, a close friend of mine, Ben Lorica, who led the AI conference at O'Reilly and Strata Data, um, I've done a lot of work with Ben, still do a lot of work with Ben, and he was interested in having um, sort of a deep dive into AutoML, what's happening, uh, presented to executives, like for a business crowd. Uh, so I, I did this talk about it um, to really explore it. And I, I did a lot of research in the area, looking through open source projects, reading just way too many papers, but also playing with the code a lot to, to dig in and talking to the people who are doing a lot of this work. And I presented a few um, uh, business summit talks for O'Reilly about AutoML, and those were received really well. Um, and then my friends over at IBM Data Science Community, I also do some work there. Um, so uh, Will Roberts and I did an article that was more hands-on. Uh, it was more of an introduction to what's going on, especially the open source side, um, and really more for developers, for Python developers, um, whereas the work before had been kind of introducing uh, business executives. So a lot of this is based around the article that Will and I did for the IBM data science community. And um, I'll, I'll put in a plug there. I, I work for a company called Derwin, and so you can link to me there uh, at DerwinAI slash Paco or I'm on Twitter a lot um, as Pacoid, but um, also I'm really involved with the data science community. So that's where I'm presenting from now. Um, so I'm gonna dig into the idea of AutoML and just as a one-liner, um, can we use machine learning to help our work, improve our work in machine learning? I think that's probably the best way to describe it. I mean, there is a product called AutoML that comes out of Google and they're very famous for that but there's a lot of other areas. And I, I really wanna explore the whole range of what's going on because it speaks to really the entire workflow, the end-to-end -end life cycle of when you're working on machine learning projects. Um, and I'll say that <clears throat> you probably have a gradient problem because almost all of what we do with machine learning is about some kind of differentiable data. You've, you've got data and you know, your, your hypothesis is that we can divide the data into different cases, we can put labels on those cases, or we can find other ways to say that certain groups of data are interesting together. <clears throat> so we'll explore through some of that. Um, but first, I want to just dive into what is a machine learning algorithm? Um, and so if we, if we talk about kind of in the simple case, the most common case would be supervised learning. <clears throat> and with supervised learning, we've got a bunch of data. We train a model. Um, we've got labels on different kinds of, of, of classes of data that we're interested in. The model learns those patterns. And then when you give it new data, it's able to predict or classify what labels it thinks based on what the input is. And pretty much when you look across the board at all the different kinds of supervised learning, they have certain things in common. Um, you know, there's there's little parts of the algorithms that are called learners, and those are what really track the patterns that we're trying to learn and generalize from them. <clears throat> and we're trying to optimize the learners by running the machine learning algorithm. And to do that, there's a couple, uh, like from a mathematical view, there's typically a loss function, which says, hey, I can see this pattern and I can kind of fuzz it a little bit and then generalize. So if I see something close to that pattern before, I can pick it up. And there's also usually a regularization term which says don't overfit. And what that means is, you know, if I if I train uh, a model off of some historical data um, and it learns those patterns really, really well, then maybe it will learn them too well and will overfit, as we say, such that when it gets new patterns in the future, it won't be able to recognize them. So a regularization term is a way of kind of injecting some noise so that it can be general purpose um, or more general. I should say. And the way that these kind of algorithms usually work is there's typically some kind of problem usually solved by a variation of gradient descent. Um, stochastic gradient descent is one way um, that's very popular. There's some others, there's gradient ascent, etc. But at the end of the day, you're trying to search through a haystack to find the needles. 
And you probably have to go up and down some hills to do that. That's gradient descent. So um, if I were to pick a, a really super well-known problem, uh, there's this thing called the iris data set. <clears throat> and there's three species of iris flower. There's Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. And this was studied thoroughly, um, like last century. Uh, there's this data set that's been around for decades, and it has about 150 line on it, or rows in it. And there are these three species that are described, and there's measurements for like the petal woods. Somebody got out there and like measured all these flowers and, and marked down the data. Um, but we use it in machine learning a lot because it's a, it's a pretty good representative small data set that shows off a lot of the problems. Um, turns out that Versicolor and Virginica species of iris, they kind of overlap. They're very similar. And so the data points actually overlap. So a lot of machine learning algorithms kind of mess that up. Whereas like Satosa is really easy to pick out. Now, if I were to take the iris uh, data set <clears throat> and run it through a machine learning algorithm, say, um, you know, I, I run it through uh, a random forest and I'm building up a bunch of learners, each of which are decision trees. So what that means is I'm gonna pick some parameter for my model, maybe 10, it says that I'm gonna go create 10 decision trees and for each one of those, I'm going to sample out of my data set and I'm going to build a decision tree that describes how to recognize a species of iris flower. And then I'm going to go repeat that over and over. So the learners would be a decision tree and the loss function, there's a bunch of math, but it's pretty well known. The regularization term, there's even more math. It's also pretty well known. At the end of the day, uh, you know, if you use an algorithm like random forest, it's nice in the sense that it has a built-in measurement of out-of-band error. So as soon as you're done training the algorithm, you already have some evaluation of how well it did. And so I, I did a graph there, and you can see this chart where the, the loss term is decreasing. Um, basically, as you train it and get more trees in there, um, the algorithm, the model, uh, becomes more and more effective at, at recognizing has less error. Um, there's a notebook. I can show it a little bit later, but there's a notebook if you want to run through where I generated all this. Uh, it, it uses the iris data set and it shows using scikit-learn uh, to train models and then evaluate those models. Um, now, the other thing that we really should talk about in terms of machine learning is uh, you've probably heard the terms parameters and hyperparameters. Um, the idea of parameters is that when I'm using the algorithm to train some learners, um, and I'm differentiating my data, pulling it apart. Um, then I keep track of basically the paths that have gone through the data and how to run that again. And those are my parameters. That means I can sort of rerun the model with new data. Um, and often that's very large number of parameters. If you look at some of the natural language work uh, that's being done like BERT and the transformers, that can be billions of parameters. Hyperparameters are really interesting though because they are just a much, typically a much smaller set that you use to guide the algorithms, guide the search to find the models. So if we apply this to our iris data set, then I've got three species, I've got 150 rows. Um, let's say that I want to train it with random forest and I want to use 10 trees. Um, my hyperparameter there, there's just one of them. It's the number of trees, which I'll say I'll set to 10. And then the parameters that get generated when I train the model, that's gonna be, um, okay, 10 trees, and then for each tree, it's gonna be log of the number of dimensions, so log four. And so that works out to being over six. Let's say it's seven. It's a pretty small model. Um, but there's a big difference between having one hyperparameter and then seven parameters. Um, and the difference is that the hyperparameters really guide this search through your, your gradient, through all of your data. And so I, I, I want to underscore how that's a, a real theme here, because if let's take a kind of a grand tour from a high level of machine learning. There's supervised learning, uh, which is you know, most of what people talk about. And that, that's what we were just showing. I have a bunch of data. I train a model and I associate some labels. And then when I have new input data that comes in, I can predict what those labels are. There's also unsupervised learning. And you know you, you don't have any labels there, 
But what happens is <clears throat> the algorithms go ahead and divide up the data into, say, clusters. So clustering algorithms are kind of unsupervised. And so basically, they're generating some kind of proxy for labels. But they're still doing a lot of the same kind of work under the hood in terms of differentiating data, working through those gradients. Um, there's also active learning, if you've heard. It's a really exciting area. It's sometimes called human in the loop. Um, and that's where it's much like uh, supervised learning, where you've got an algorithm that's trying to train. The problem is, though, sometimes the results coming out of the model are going to have a lot of uncertainty. And in that case, with active learning, the algorithm will kick it back to a human expert and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you give me a label? And so then the human gives a, a new label, a new judgment, and that feeds back in and you iterate and train and produce better models that way. Active learning is a really interesting way if you don't have a lot of labels to get your people involved and really bring in that human expertise into cleaning up your data. There's also something called self-supervision. You might have seen talks out of um, Facebook and other companies that are using this a lot. Um, and, and basically, if you have a data object, we were just talking about data classes, um, if you have some sort of data object, can you take different views of it? Can you take from one complex object, can you sample different views and then use those uh, effectively to, to kind of stand in place of what you would do with labels? Um, and then it's pretty much the same as what you're doing with supervised learning above. Um, of course, there's a lot of talk about deep learning. Deep learning is a, typically what we're talking about with deep learning is a kind of supervised learning. Um, you have different layers of neural networks and then they're connected by autoencoders. For what it's worth, um, starting in 1984, I began working in this area called neural networks. And I, I ended up doing like seven years of research and development in neural networks. And at the time, everybody was you know, trying to coach me and say, hey, this will never go anywhere. Why are you wasting time on it? Um, so it's kind of fun to see how neural networks have turned around 30 years later. Um, but a lot of really interesting work in deep learning. Reinforcement learning is a, a kind of an older area of control theory, but it's being revisited in the context of machine learning now. So I mean, you can go back like 50 years or more, and there's great stuff about reinforcement learning. They just, they were doing control systems like flying aircraft. Um, but now you can take a lot of those same simulations and then put agents on which learn how to navigate with inside of an, an environment, a simulation. <clears throat> and you can use deep learning to help those agents learn. And that's what reinforcement learning typically does. Um, for what it's worth, one of my colleagues and friends and co-conspirators is named Dean Wampler. He, I believe, has spoken at um, Chippy a few times before. Um, we just came out with a reinforcement learning tutorial on the AnyScale blog a little bit earlier today, uh, which is really geared at Python developers. So um, I'll, I'll give a link about that later. There's also something called weak supervision, which is a way of um, basically if you have a bunch of different experts that are giving you labels to describe your data, can you come up with models to describe your different experts? So maybe Joe is good at like 80% of the cases he gets right, 20% usually gets them wrong. And then Mary is really good at like a different, you know, 95% and it's not exactly the same as Joe. So if you put them together and you have models about where they're good and where they're typically wrong, you can start to make decisions about the experts who are labeling your data. And so then you can start to inject some machine learning into like the early stages of how you collect and label your data. Um, there's also transfer learning, which is basically learn a supervised learning model, but then like for a neural network, um, keep the top layers, uh, keep the bottom layers uh, uh, as they were originally trained and let the top few layers float and then retrain it on a smaller set of your own data so you can reuse somebody else's model. There's some other areas too. Knowledge graph is kind of different than machine learning typically, but it's very complementary. I do a lot of work in that area. Um, the main takeaway though out of all this is that there's a larger category called meta-learning and it's still very much an active research area. But a lot of what we're gonna talk about is meta-learning throughout the rest of this discussion. And so the idea with meta-learning is um, as we're working in Python to build out machine learning workflows, whether we're working with PyTorch, like Joel was talking about, I really love PyTorch, um, or, or scikit-learn or, or whatever, um, 
as we build a workflow, what's really interesting is can we keep track of different workflows that we've done in the past? And if you're on a data science team, can you keep a kind of history, like uh, a database or a knowledge graph to describe problems that your team has worked on before? And then can you do some data mining off of that so that when you have new problems your team must solve in the future, can you sort of pick up from a known point and reuse some other configurations? Um, and so that's kind of the gist of meta learning. And it's a way of basically using data and data mining and machine learning to help make this whole process of data science much easier to work on, much more effective. All right, so let me switch gears and say, okay, we're working with gradients and what you have in machine learning, it's probably a search problem. And it's interesting because I, you know, I, I love Joel's book. Uh, I read that a couple of nights ago and cover to cover and I really, really love it. And, and he has some similar notions there. I highly recommend buying this book, by the way, um, because it teaches you a sort of a grand tour of computer science theory and software engineering practice all in like seven, or sorry, 10 scenarios, really succinct. But he goes into some cases which are basically saying, you know, this is kind of a problem is, is, is a matter of search. And definitely if you roll the clock back and go to like hard AI in the 1980, actually 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, um, if you look at the earlier research about AI, uh, they were really focused on search problems. So it's probably not too strange that like the two big AI firms to pop out of Stanford, which had a lot of this early AI research, were you know Yahoo and Google were big search engines. Um, when we're building machine learning models, the challenge is to be able to find the best hyperparameters for a given kind of use case for a given set of input data. And once we have those hyperparameters, then we're pretty much guaranteed that we can crunch the numbers and get to a model. So if we could just find the right hyperparameters quickly, then we'd have to do much less training, much less search, if you will. But that's not a simple task because when we're developing machine learning models, sometimes there's a lot of challenging and, and even conflicting processes going on. Like for instance, um, what algorithm should we use? I mean, what's gonna fit really well with the use case? How much training data do we need? Do we have enough? Do we need to add more? Um, which features do we need to highlight? Because frankly, some features are noise. Some features are even worse than noise and have to be sort of redacted out of the data to be able to train a good model. Um, and then once we've got models, how can we compare them and evaluate the results and understand their relative trade-offs? Because it's not simple to just evaluate a bunch of different kinds of machine learning algorithms. They produce different kinds of results, different kinds of metrics. On and on and on. There's a lot of different assumptions that when you really get into the practice of deploying machine learning uh, and, and you know what's definitely being called ML ops of, of putting machine learning into uh, operations, there's a lot of issues to, to be concerned with. Um, and also, you know, there's always human decisions that go into the mix. I mean, even if you have something that's been collected by machines, a big data set that was automatically collected, some human decisions went into deciding what to collect. So there's always this level of like human judgment that comes in. We have to be able to understand it and troubleshoot it. Um, and you know, the other thing I really underscore is like this area of data science, machine learning and AI, it's become so big and so diverse and complex <clears throat> really no one person can understand all of it and really do justice to try and solve a problem. So I, I really try to say that data science is a team sport. And you really have to put together a lot of different perspectives when you want to build robust solutions. <clears throat> and that's another reason why machine learning is a kind of search problem, because you have to be able to, to blend those different perspectives together. <clears throat> okay, so now, Here's sort of a thought exercise. Imagine if you could take a look at all the possible variations of input data, all the possible gradients, and then compare out of those, <clears throat> which would be all the possible variations of machine learning models, the optimized parameters. Okay, that would be an enormous space. It would, you know, it, it would be uncomputable because it would be so large. But if you were able to, to look at, at that as the main problem we're trying to solve, then you can see, you know, finding the needle in the haystack, basically machine learning is a search problem. 
So the goals of AutoML as a search problem is you want to find the appropriate hyperparameters that converge down to an optimal, semi-optimal solution after training. <clears throat> and you want to identify features and data transformations that produce good training data going in. And you also want to be able to learn from history. You want to be able to re re reuse results you've had in the past. It may be that your data is changing over time and you have to retrain models, which is typically the case. Um, so you want to be able to bring in that kind of history and feedback as well. You know, and there's other considerations in machine learning that make it much more complex. Um, I, I definitely, I highly recommend these two papers. One is called Show Your Work, and the other is called Energy and Policy Considerations. And Show Your Work is, is interesting because, well, actually, both these papers, they address they, they address a phenomenon that's been happening over the past couple of years, almost three years now, in machine learning. And that's where we're seeing these enormous models, uh, like with transformers, where you have billions of parameters. And one of the problems is that using more old school uh, approaches to machine learning and coming up with smaller models may actually be a better solution for your customer in some cases. Uh, you know, time to market is, um, is really important uh, when you're talking about doing commercial work. So show your work is interesting because it actually shows cases where we're using a simpler, older kind of model is much more effective, even has better performance than using you know, the latest and greatest coming from research. Energy and policy considerations is interesting because when you look at the transformer models that are being used for natural language, um, you know, if you look at, at BERT being trained with neural architecture search, um, one model has a carbon footprint of running five automobiles for their entire lifetime, five gasoline automobiles. So it's this crazy amount of energy that goes into training these huge models and a crazy amount of carbon that's going up into the atmosphere. Um, so there, there are energy and policy considerations and we should be understanding how to use AI, but not boil the oceans. And I mean, like literally not boil the oceans. Um, there's also other issues in terms of AI trust, and uh, certainly there's a couple of great projects. Uh, I'll call out uh, to my colleague, uh, Trisha Mahoney, and, and others working in that area with AIF360 that's been moved into Linux Foundation, and it's an open source Python library for algorithms that can detect uh, fairness and bias problems with your training data, and also with how your uh, models have been trained. And uh, good news is this is, is recently, uh, part of it's been um, moved in, migrated into scikit-learn. So there's some great integration with scikit-learn now. Um, and you know, when you're working with machine learning, it's not a simple question in terms of what your goals are. You might say that you wanna have really accurate models, but it, to a machine learning person, if you say accuracy, that can mean several things. I could come up with four or five different you know, whether I'm talking about perplexity or specificity or recall or precision or on and on, there's a lot of things that are conflicting. Um, and there's also issues of like cost versus time. And, you know, can the auditors come in and understand what the model's doing? So will I be able to pass compliance? Are there security risks? Are there privacy issues, et cetera? So machine learning can be very difficult in practice. Um, which is why we're really interested in being able to use computing to be able to help out with some of the more difficult areas. And that's where AutoML comes in, and it's really super exciting. Um, if we talk about the whole workflow, again, I really want to focus on this idea of data science teams and workflows and the whole life cycle of building machine learning. Um, by the way, there was a really great track we did last year at OSCON, the open source conference, uh, where a lot of different companies came together and showed what are their ML ops practices. So I've got a link to it there from OSCON. And kind of riffing off of what we were talking about at OSCON, um, if we have like an idealized machine learning end-to-end uh, uh, -end life cycle, uh, so we've got these steps that we typically go through. You know, there's usually some sort of data preparation and you know, the idea is in data science, our teams spend 80% of their time doing data preparation. And it really makes sense, it's actually very true. That's the hard part of the problem. Um, but then you get into what kind of features do you need to have that go into training your models. The feature engineering is also a really difficult part. A lot of the math, even the statistics involved in feature engineering, they're kind of counterintuitive. And even people who do statistics all day, when they're confronted with some of the work in feature engineering, they're a bit baffled by it. So not an easy part. 
Um, there's also the optimization of models, the training the models. And then there's model selection. Uh, basically, what kind of algorithm do you want to use? And if we try you know, six different kinds of algorithms, what are the results look like? How can we pick the best ones for our use case? And then once we've got models trained and, and we've selected the good ones, you know, how can we really deploy that or integrate it out with a use case? Um, if we're talking about deploying machine learning models on some sort of embedded device, like a smartphone, then we may need to do some kind of model compression or distillation or other techniques. If we're talking about deploying it in terms of web services and having it you know, be a SaaS product, then we're talking about deploying to a cloud cluster, running in the cloud probably. So you know, how do we do that? Um, and, and the thing I really want to point out here, one of the really big insights about AutoML is that there are related work in both data governance and also in ML ops. So what we've seen over the past couple of years is this really big resurgence in data governance ever since 2018 and you know what happened with Facebook and others. Um, data governance practices tend to provide the kind of metadata that you need to really make use of AutoML. And so that's a good thing. Both these practices are, are sort of emerging at the same time. They're able to work off each other. And we're also seeing ML ops, or you might want to call it different names, but things like ML ops also emerging in the same time frame. And it turns out that the data governance practices follow from your ML ops practices, right? And so you, you get these three things that sort of build on each other: data governance, ML ops, and auto ML. And you know, they're 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 all evolving, and they're definitely not a done deal. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in data governance, even though it's decades old. But as these are evolving together, working toward the kind of solutions we face today, um, I believe that the three will be working together, sort of three pillars that you stand on. So um, I, one of the other things that I've done in the past year or so is put together, this is a, a Google spreadsheet that's open. Uh, it's got listings of different vendors working in AutoML and also different open source projects. Um, it's looking at a whole bunch of them. And whenever I find new ones, I just sort of toss them in there. So if you want a whole big listing of AutoML projects, it's definitely kind of one-stop shopping. Um, the other thing is that I highly recommend um, this resource on GitHub, it's called Awesome Auto ML Papers, and it's updated about every week. Um, the author is doing this really fantastic job of having a taxonomy of different auto ML projects on GitHub and different papers and being able to classify them. So that's another really good place to look to find out what's going on. Um, OK, so I had a, a, a diagram earlier you see at the top of like the full Indian lifecycle of preparing machine learning to go out into customer use cases. So let's take the first stage, data preparation. <clears throat> and there are things there that you can do that, that are really interesting. I, I talked about weak supervision before, and that's where you can take the different judgments being done by people or experts and sort of treat them as a kind of, of machine learning modeling. Um, there's a way to extend that that's being called auto data preparation. And if you look at projects like Snorkel or Holoclean, um, I, I think especially Holoclean, I've got linked out to there. Uh, and it's, it's really fascinating how we can start to automate some of those kinds of practices, particularly when you take into account that data science teams, again, spend so much of their time at this stage. Um, now, when we get to the feature engineering part, this is really difficult. Um, I highly recommend a couple of friends of mine, um, Alice Shang and Amanda Kasari. Uh, they did a book. Uh, 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 Hey, uh, Paco, I think we uh, we might have lost your mic. I, I can't hear you right now. All right, excuse us, everybody. We're... Uh... I, I think you might be muted. 
Oh, their test test. Is that better? Yeah, I, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. Something there might have been a, like a control that muted it automatically. Yeah, um, no worries. How far I, back? I, was I think it was like the last like thirty seconds to a minute. Okay, cool. Um, so I was showing here. Um, Clicking from slide. Um, data prep. I think we got through that. Basically, I really, um, I really recommend Holoclean as one of the really interesting open source projects right now, based off of some of the ideas coming out of Snorkel for this auto data preparation. Um, and then feature engineering. There's a there's a great book uh, by Ellis Shang and Amanda Kasari uh, that goes into just the full range of what's going on in feature engineering. Some of that can be very difficult. Uh, it gets pretty heavy on statistics, but Again, if we can help automate parts with, with tools like MLbox or AutoML Toolkit. Um, there's a really great paper, too, uh, a friend of mine out of U Manchester uh, wrote on stability of feature selection algorithms. We're starting to understand that sometimes some of the data that you feed into your machine learning models, um, over time, some of it is probably less risky than others if you want to have some sort of robust modeling. Um, that paper was a very surprising one. I think it actually surprised the authors how popular it became. Um, there's the area of training machine learning models. And when people talk about machine learning, they usually kind of rush toward this. Um, actually, this is probably the least interesting part of the workflow uh, because it's pretty well known. Um, but the hyperparameter optimization is really what, what started AutoML. And so a lot of the early descriptions about AutoML really focus just on this. Um, it's sometimes abbreviated as HPO, hyperparameter optimization. And so there are some very long established projects like HyperOp. Um, there's also Autokeras and some newer stuff like Raytune um, that, that focus on how can we get to the right hyperparameters. Uh, and uh, that's important. And certainly if you're working with deep learning and you're running on a big cluster, that can represent a lot of the costs that you're going to spend over time. Um, but I, I, I do want to underscore that like throughout the whole Indian life cycle of machine learning, there are other parts of it that are probably even more complicated than this. Um, OK, so once you've gotten a machine learning model trained, and maybe you're using a few different algorithms and comparing them against each other, doing a bake off, um, how can you help to be able to evaluate which one's better for the use case? Um, there are projects like Auto Scikit-Learn um, which uh, this gets into maybe you want to use multiple models together. Um, maybe you want to be building ensembles. And you know, that was one of the big learnings out of the Netflix prize years and years ago was the teams that coalesce together and build big ensembles for the ones that won. Um, so this is a really interesting area because that's a hard problem. But being able to use ensembles really it helps reduce a lot of the risks and bias. Um, and it's very, it's a very powerful approach, uh, sophisticated approach in machine learning. And then finally, when you get down to the point of deployment, um, how do you make your machine learning models fit your use case? Um, and there are some great examples, you know, that commercial examples like working with SageMaker, working with Watson Studio. Um, <clears throat> there's native, K native, however you want to pronounce that. But if you want to consider the idea of auto scaling and really how do you take your models and make them fit the use case, um, those are good examples for it. On the other flip side of the coin, though, is where we have machine learning models that we want to embed. And I think, in particular, there's a really fascinating work in what's being called TinyML. Um, so if you haven't seen it, uh, Pete Warden from TensorFlow uh, and the work that he's done with TinyML. Also, there's a conference called TinyML Summit. But definitely check out um, some of these links I have about the low power machine learning. Uh, it's really fascinating. There's chips that you can buy that cost less than 50 cents on eBay, even less if you buy them in quantity. And you can run multiple deep learning models on them in parallel um, and like run off of ambient light with no battery. Really, really crazy stuff. But I think that that's a lot of the future on the edge of how do we deploy really sophisticated models out to low power kinds of use cases. Um, uh, this talk is being sponsored, being done with IBM, and I'll, I'll throw in, I'm really not the person to speak to this, but IBM has some products in this area. Um, there is a, a trial of Watson Studio. There's a link down here, IBM Biz. Um, and if you want to go through and learn more about that, definitely we've got some people who can help answer questions. 
And then looking ahead, I think this is really interesting. Um, I described before about meta learning as being this thing that's over the entire workflow and sort of learning from your history, your team's history. <clears throat> and that's kind of striking toward, I guess you'd say, semi-automated data science. There are a couple of projects that are trying to strike toward that. One of them is called Lale. It's in Python, and I'll show that in a bit. There's another one called Teapot that's a little bit more established. Um, but I also have a survey here of a few different papers. Peter Bill at uh, Berkeley, of course, has been pretty famous in this area. Um, it is active research, but it's really super fascinating. And I, I think that some of the lessons learned from companies like Lyft and Uber over the past few years since GDPR was introduced, um, they're getting a lot more interested in this area. There's also some related things in terms of program synthesis. So if you haven't seen it, there's a great project called AutoPandas. Um, I've got a link here. <clears throat> and it's a way of being able to show a Pandas data frame, sort of your input, and then what you need for your training your machine learning model. And then AutoPandas can generate the Python code in between it. And there's related projects like that for SQL. But this area of like program synthesis and using machine learning, especially deep learning to do it, um, I, I think there's a lot going on there. Definitely watch that space closely. And related, of course, there's also the auto completion tools that are going into IDEs. Um, and so you see things like tab nine, where they can do really smart completion for you while you're typing code. This is related. I mean, this is part of how we build machine learning models. Um, if, you're, if your IDD can predict what you need to be coding next. Um, and then, you know, one thing that maybe it's a little bit cynical, but I, I think it's really true for what's going on in this. There's a great um, this link here, 100x increase in cloud-based computation. It's, uh, it's a talk by Jeff Dean from Google. Um, and he gave this talk at TensorFlow Dev Summit uh, a couple of years ago. And what he said was basically, look, your problem is you've got to hire AI experts, you've got a bunch of data, and you have to do some cloud computing. And you put these all together, and you come out with an AI product. Well, if you can't hire enough of the right people, then you could just spend maybe 100 times more on the cloud compute, and we'll use AutoML to like replace the people you can't hire. It's kind of cynical. It's also kind of true. And so we see this from the cloud providers. They typically have really good AI teams, and almost all of them are producing some type of AutoML services to really augment your team. It's not necessarily about replacing people. It's more about, hey, as a data science team, you get really busy. You need to have some services that augment and make your life better you know, so you can be more effective in what you're doing. Um, the other thing is just hardware is going crazy, especially when it comes to deep learning and, and other areas of machine learning. Um, if you haven't seen Cerebras and some of the others, I mean, we're talking about like five orders of magnitude on chip performance increase over the most sophisticated GPUs coming out of NVIDIA. Um, so hardware is going to be one of the real big game changers in this area for making AutoML, which is expensive, something that's less expensive to use. Um, so in conclusion, um, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of really interesting work in AutoML. Um, it's not magic. It definitely it's something that chews up a lot of compute cycles, but it can help augment the work that you're doing currently and, and help augment your teams. Um, and we definitely think that as we see, uh, you know, more of the theory advance, more of the hardware acceleration advance, uh, this is going to become more and more of what we're doing. Um, so we're using machine learning to, in clever ways to try to make machine learning more effective. That's kind of the promise. Um, okay, I've got some coding examples if we have time I can run through, or I can at least show some of the notebooks if you want to run through this yourself. Uh, Ali, do we have time? Yeah, please take take all the time you need. Like, would love to see like these examples of this. Like, this is fascinating. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm super excited about. It. I'm glad you like it. I, there's there's a lot going on here. Um, let me get back to first one. <clears throat> uh, well, I'll do this one. Yeah, okay, I'll do this one first. I had shown a little bit earlier about Iris. Um, it's an extremely well known data set, and if you haven't done any machine learning before. It's really great to have a common data set and try to work through different libraries with it, because then you know what to expect. You, you can kind of understand what to anticipate and see if you know you got the code right or, or if the library is working correctly. Uh, sometimes they don't. But um, here's what I was using in the first few slides to take Iris and then run it through um, like this visualization. 
Um, and you can see the clusters sort of work, like one species is really separate, but the others overlap. That's the problem. Um, and here's some really simple code in scikit-learn um, where I'm taking, uh, doing model selection um, and then going in and using random forest to build a classifier. And then I, I just, uh, you know, I take and I show the, the scores, the loss. Uh, basically, as we're doing gradient descent, training this algorithm or training learners through this algorithm, you can see how the loss decreases. So uh, if you want to work with Iris, that's a good one. Um, I do a lot of work on a project called Ray, which is, uh, like I say, I think Dean Wampler has talked about that before. But Ray is in Python. It's a way of doing um, both uh, actor pattern as well as uh, parallel task. So there's two kinds of parallelization that you can do with Ray just by adding a few decorators. Uh, and I've taken existing uh, Python code that was fairly complex for you know, large production systems. And after adding about five lines of Ray, I had parallelized it. Um, so really check out Ray. In particular, though, there's a lot of support. It was built to support machine learning. Um, and Parker, do you mind making uh, the notebook just a little bit bigger? Sorry to interrupt. Oh yeah, uh, probably too small of fonts. So let me. Come yeah. On. Uh, let me get my view a little higher. Zoom in. Yeah, my system's taking a little time. Um, let me zoom in a little bit more. How's that? Is that better? Can we go just to like maybe like one or two more? Yeah, I'm trying to. My notebook seems to use that process is looking. There we go. Okay, 400%, okay, awesome. is that good? Yeah, I think that's better, thank you. Sure, um, this, okay, this is scrolling a little bit slowly. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff running on my laptop here, so it's probably going slow. Um, and it's probably still zooming. Um, let me try to manage that. Oh, come on. Um, okay, so what I've got here is just, it's a really brief uh, view of using Ray. Uh, there's a part called Tune. Uh, you can see that, um, come on, I may need to stop some stuff. Um, I'm getting a lot of lag here, so it's still, yeah, yeah. I we, we can uh, We can wait for your computer to catch up, that's okay. Okay, sorry about that. It's it's like a two-year-old laptop and my keyboard's almost falling apart, but that's one of the biggest problems I've had during the pandemic is the local Apple store still isn't really running at full speed. Um, Let me see what else I can do. Um, let me shift. No, I shouldn't do that. I want to be able to show this stuff. Huh, I can talk through it. Um, OK. Wow, this is not really responding at all. Um, let me do one thing. I'm going to turn off OBS, which is kind of what Joel was warning me about. So let me turn off OBS. I'm, my video is going to be gone for a sec. OK. And once I do that, um, camera mic, yes. Okay, cool. Can you see my yeah, camera? Yeah, we don't have the max red, uh, the max headroom effect, but it looks uh, we can see you. <laughs> okay, great. So I'm hoping that um, with OBS gone, which is exactly what um, Joel was saying, uh, hopefully with OBS not running in the background, I'll be able to get something responsive out of my browser now. Um, Ray is, uh, again, this project for uh, doing parallel processing in Python. It's very simple to use. Um, there's a part of it that's called Tune that uh, provides AutoML features. And so what it can do is, um, I'll show a, a quick example here. Um, I just do a few imports to be able to bring in Ray and Raytune. And then I'm going to create something that looks a little bit like a machine learning problem. Um, I've got this this one function to find, easy objective. <clears throat> and I've got a couple of, of terms in there. Um, I'm, I basically got a loss function, which would be similar to like what happens inside of a machine learning algorithm. I've got a couple of parameters there. And basically, when you get close to those parameters, then the model will come back and report less error. Um, I'm also throwing in a few sleeps to make this more expensive, so that when you know it's a kind of an iterative problem. And if the sleeps are in there, then um, the iterations are going to Cost some time. So to run Ray, I'm just going to make sure I'm not running it before. I'm, I do a Ray shutdown, and then I immediately do an init. Um, 
and then that'll run a local cluster. If I wanted to run in the cloud, I would just attach to a cluster using a, a very similar uh, line, but just with you know a, an address for the cluster. And Ray will come back and tell me a little bit of um, something that looks a lot like JSON, but isn't exactly. Um, it'll tell me where the cluster is running. Um, great. So I've got Ray running in the background. And then I'm going to come in here. I'm going to describe a problem, a, 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 an auto ML problem. I'm going to say, I want to do hyperparameter optimization. I want to do a, a Bayesian optimization search. <clears throat> and I've got this, this metric that I'm going to try to optimize, mean loss. And remember, that's the thing that's described up here in this easy objective function. Um, I've got a couple of arguments that are coming into it. Uh, and, well, I actually need to provide a couple of arguments for Ray. So uh, outside of what I define, uh, we're talking about UCB, which is upper, upper confidence bound. Um, if you look through the documentation about Ray Tune, we'll go into more details about that. Um, that's, that's one of the kind of algorithms that's used for reinforcement learning. Um, then I can come in and say, okay, I, I want to configure this problem. Um, you know, if I'm just going to test it, I'll do 10 iterations. If not, I'll do 1,000 iterations. <clears throat> and then once I get to a certain number of time steps, I'll stop it. And then I can set up a scheduler, basically schedule a job to say that I, I want to go after this metric mean loss and I want to try to minimize it, um, which means that I want to minimize the loss function in my, my pseudo machine learning algorithm. That's what you're usually doing. And then it's just a matter of calling Raytune with my objective function, uh, my model, and then my configuration and what kind of schedule I'm going to use. And this cranks along. Um, I just ran this on my laptop right before the talk. And so I've got, uh, it's, it's running through the status where it's showing um, every number of trials. It's going to come out and print out its status. Um, so it's showing here that I've got two parameters I'm trying to search for. One is height and one is width. Those correspond to the height and width here. And what it's finding in just a few iterations is the width is pretty close to like 14. Um, and so it's running through all these and you'll see, I'll scroll through the log here. It would take a while, probably longer than we have to, to run all these algorithms I was gonna to show tonight. So I'm just gonna show the results. But basically I'm running through all these experiments and it's searching. And you can see, okay, great. We got a width 14, another one kind of okay with width six, another one on and on. But basically it, it's, it's going through running a lot of parallel jobs and then finding out that, okay, my parameters for the width probably need to be somewhere around 14. So that hyperparameter is being optimized. You can see now it's kind of zeroing in. And I'll scroll down a lot further because this log was way too long. Um, uh, let's get down to the bottom. But then we get down toward the bottom, and you know we've got something that's at least for the width parameter. I ran it like ten times. Um, we're starting to zero in on it, and so then it would start to kick over and focus on the height parameter. And it's like, okay, where can we zero in on that? Um, and of course, if you have a lot of different parameters, this might take a lot of iterations. But there's an argument to be said that this is much smarter than just a grid search. It's much smarter than a brute force approach. And then typically, it's going to be much smarter than people who are just sort of throwing darts, who are you know, guessing about what the parameters should be. Or maybe guess, train a model, see how it works, go back and guess again. This is basically going to be a lot more efficient. Um, so again, with really like less than 10 lines of Python code, let me drop this down. Come on. Yeah, with less than 10 lines of Python code for the part that did the training, um, yeah, I was able to go in and do some, some auto ML. Um, I want to jump to a different set of notebooks here. Let me scoot this one over. Um, this is with a project in uh, Python. It's called Lale, and uh, it's it's a name in Persian. Uh, half my family is from Iran and India, so um, I, I, I like seeing a Persian name on, on open source. Um, it's called Lale, and it's basically doing a lot of what we were talking about in terms of, of meta learning. So Lale is a way to describe a machine learning workflow, a whole pipeline, and in ways start to synthesize parts of it. So here's an example using scikit-learn. And what we're going to do is we've got some sample data, and we're going to say, OK, well, at the first part, 
we might do some dimensional reduction using PCA, or we might just skip that. You know, maybe we don't need to. So there's two choices. There's a no-op or there's PCA. And then after that, okay, let's let's train a model. Let's uh, see if we can use logistic regression or like a nearest neighbors classifier and just see which one works out better. Um, so we, th we throw this in, we define uh, basically a workflow here, really just a few lines of Python, and then we can visualize it. And so we've got these couple uh, choice points, decision points there. Um, okay, now we go in and start to use Lale, uh, start to build it out. And so it does some hyperparameter optimization. And we find out um, that, yeah, actually using PCA was good. And, and uh, in this case, it was using uh, nearest neighbor as opposed to using logistic regression. Uh, and this, this use case here, you can twist it two different ways. You can make it find the worst or make it find the best. Um, but it's a real simple, concise example of where I have a data set, I have some possible algorithms that are known to be good with that kind of use case. Um, let me just throw together a workflow and let it solve itself. Uh, so I, I, I love what's going on with the Lolly community because they're really integrating a lot of the other parts and uh, they're bringing in other open source projects and then making them work together. And I just really love what's going on there. Um, now, this is another part that Lolly has integrated. Um, just given the time, I, I can only show a couple. But um, it's, a, it's called AIF. 360 toolkit. It's the AI fairness and bias 360, and um, and in this case, you know, uh, it started out at IBM Labs, but they were using work from Google and Amazon and others, uh, Microsoft and whatnot, and uh, and then they contributed all of it to Linux Foundation. So it's an open source project at Linux Foundation now, um, but it's all about being able to detect bias uh, in your training data sets. And you know that might lead to gender bias or racial bias or however. Um, but how can we detect that even before we, we get in trouble and deploy the models? How can we catch it earlier in the in the workflow? And then how can we go back and rebalance uh, the data that we have so that we're not injecting bias? How, you know we can we can work with unbalanced data sets and we can algorithmically work with those. So in this case here, um, we're looking at for instance here's some uh, uh, here's a credit assessment problem, and we've got some protected class data, like what is your gender, what is your, what is your age. Um, we don't want those going into the models. Um, we, but even beyond just like what are the names of the columns, let's take a look at the data and start analyzing it to figure out um, you know, where do we think that there is bias and how can we try to correct for it. Um, so here, uh, Lale is bringing in AF360, and then we're bringing in Scikit-Learn and XGBoost. Um, so we're going to evaluate some different classifiers. And again, it's kind of the similar thing. We've got PCA versus not for cleaning up the data. And then our choices are logistic regression, XGBoost, very popular, or uh, support vector machines. Um, and that's all defined up here. It's just like a one-liner uh, in Python. It's really great. Um, OK, so then we go through and we do some training. We find out, OK, for this data, it looks like um, PCA is good, and then we're gonna go into logistic regression. Um, but then we start looking at the, the metrics, and then we start to bring in, okay, let's reevaluate that in the context of how much bias has gone into this, this model. And can we define some privilege groups versus some, uh, uh, basically some, some columns that could introduce bias versus others that wouldn't? Um, and we can come out with attributes to start to zero in on where people should look at the disparity that's coming out of how the model is trained. So I think that this is fascinating because now we can start to pull together, a, you know, five or six different open source projects in Python and build a workflow and start to do the automated training. But along with it, let's not just look at how accurate it is. Let's look at how much disparity is going into it and really what's the impact on the judgments that's coming out of that. Um, AF360 is like a universe into itself. Okay, there's a lot in there. I'm not going to go really be able to do it justice within a few minutes. Um, but this is a, a, a real you know, concise example showing how one of the kinds of use cases for it. Um, I could go a lot further. There, there is an article that goes in detail that, again, this talk was based off of. Um, and that'll be in the links that we share. Kind of goes into more history and a little bit more discussion. Um, there's a lot of links. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, 
So a car uh, leader who does uh, one of the developer meetups in San Francisco for IBM, um, he put together, uh, based off of what we're doing in this talk, he, he put a lot of the links together into one GitHub project. So that's kind of one-stop shopping. And the slides are there, too. Um, there's a, a really great article about AF 360 being integrated with scikit-learn. That's been pretty recent. Um, so I'm excited about how that and helping you build out some of the use cases and tutorials for it. Um, the papers I was talking about, those are mostly on archive. Um, but show your work is a really, really great paper. And then this one is scary about like one machine learning model costing the same as running five cars during their lifetime. Uh, really crazy stuff in terms of energy and let's not let's not destroy the planet by using AI. Um, awesome auto mail papers is here. I highly recommend what's going on there. A really great person to follow, hi Bayesian. And um, and if you want to look more at Raytune, um, here's a tutorial that Dean Wampler and I did recently that he, there's actually a video for it, but it's taking market data for the last century and then running a, a multi-armed bandit in Ray um, and using Raytune to optimize it. Um, and it actually comes out with like a 7% return on portfolio. It's pretty cool. Um, the other thing that I'll throw out is I'm on the committee for JupyterCon. I was the chair for the last one two years ago. Um, Joel Gruse, who spoke before me, he gave the best talk, the most popular talk about why, why he hates Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, people, it was really, really excellent work. Uh, we hope to have a lot more coming up on October for that. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks so much, Paco. Can we give Paco a round of applause in the, in the chat? Uh, so we do have some questions in. But if you do have a question, please ask them in the chat. I will be reading them out. Uh, so personally, do you see AutoML causing the field of data science to contract or expand going forward? I actually see it being able to expand. I mean, I think, so um, Ben Lorca, my, my colleague Ben Lorca and I did this set of surveys a couple of years ago about AI adoption in industry. And it was really fascinating. Um, it was supposed to go out to like 300 people after a conference. And the marketing person, there was an email list that had tens of thousands of people. Somebody hit the wrong button. Um, so we got like all this data coming back about enterprise use of machine learning. And we started analyzing it. And we did two other follow-up surveys to really dig in. Um, and what Ben and I were finding and, and what we're seeing now out of like the ML Ops community is, wow, there's a whole bunch of research and there's all kinds of amazing software to go in. But the time that it takes from like a business person describing a problem to like actually seeing some proof point of like, hey, can we write code that actually makes this work? You know, if that time goes beyond a certain limit, nobody cares. And so there's this there's this real opportunity to use AI and a lot of companies are really going for it. Other companies are like, why should I bother? Yeah. And, and you know, we see the split, it's about 56% of the companies that are kind of like, why should we bother? Um, and it, it's a shame because, you know, a, you have to get your ducks in a row. You have to get your data infrastructure in, in shape and you have to pay down tech debt and you have to build up your teams and, and allow them to be able to collaborate with each other. And if you don't do those things, you won't be able to really take advantage of machine learning at an enterprise scale. And all of those things take years to really fix as far as enterprise transformation. So it's, we see this sort of this split between haves and have nots uh, where some companies get it and they're moving ahead and they're increasing their investment. And uh, and then others just don't care. They're not even getting started. They're already years behind. Uh, when Ben and I did the survey, we, we had this uh, question about how much money are you spending out of your total IT budget on machine learning? And you know we were like 5, 10, 15%. And like we did a catch-all 20%. It's like nobody's going to choose that. It's like 40% of the companies that have deployed machine learning for five years or more are spending more than 20% of their total IT budget on machine learning. Wow. So there's this big split then between the haves and the have-nots, and it's really serious. And I, I don't think that you know AutoML is necessarily going to get rid of anybody in data science because there's so much demand. But what it's going to do is like the older, stodgier companies that are kind of late to the party, it's going to at least give them ways where they can they can go in and be comp more competitive. Um, so in some ways, maybe it saves jobs. Okay, that's awesome. So. Uh would you say it's like ready for prime time? Like, would you be running some of these models in production? Yeah, there, there are some parts. Uh, I see some old friends on here. Uh, um, 
Yeah, there are some parts. And I would point to um, you know, some of the companies, some of the vendors I listed there. I have friends, uh, I'll shout out to my friends at Determined AI, um, and Lee Tallwalker and Evan Sparks and, and company. Um, they've been doing really excellent work. They just moved a lot of their stuff into open source. But yeah, certainly production. Um, a lot of the companies that are really active in deep learning, they, they're training on their own hardware. Um, that's kind of what we see. Uh, for the people who are really into it, they buy up hardware. But then how do you optimize running on your own hardware? Um, Determined AI has done some really interesting work. Amit Tallwalker was one of the early people, uh, well, and Evan also doing their postdocs in AutoML kinds of areas. And so, I mean, this is like mainstream companies. How do they reduce the bill for training deep learning models? Because that can be a really serious bill. Um, and you know, there, there's other areas too. Uh, I think a lot of these open source projects are really interesting, like Lale, uh, is sponsored by IBM, and IBM's doing AutoML, kind of the full end-to-end -end life cycle. Um, some of the other providers are really looking at supporting that full end-to-end -end life cycle. Um, 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 Ivan Ilas, a uh, professor at Waterloo, is the one who did Holocene, got to talk with him. Really fascinating work. I think they'll be commercializing that. Um, I definitely think like Snorkel and some of the other areas of like data preparation, that's super valuable. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that AutoML is a big umbrella name, and certain pockets of it are ready for prime time. Others still need a lot of research, but they're evolving. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, and yeah, shout out to Waterloo, my alma mater. Oh, awesome, <laughs> such, a, it's such an amazing, I mean, like when I worked at Databricks, it was, it was crazy because like half the team had gone to Waterloo. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a fun place. So I, I had a question. So you were talking about how the ideas from like the 80s are coming back in fashion now. And I yeah. sort of feel like that happens in software quite a bit. Like every 10, 15 years, like this conference toss, like the things Sandy Metz was saying about object-oriented Ruby, those same <laughs> ideas are coming up in like Python right now. So right. are there any ideas you sort of see that have been like fallen off the popularity side that you think might come back? Yes, thank you very much. Excellent question. So I mean, I, I was around in AI, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm old and gray. Um, I was around back in the 80s, you know, where there were people who were old and gray at the point in the 80s uh, that were my mentors. And they were talking about things like scheduling and planning and machine learning. I mean, a funny story that my graduate advisor was Doug Lennett, and he was one of the first professors at Stanford doing uh, machine learning models, really, um, a lot of work in it. And, and they bounced him, like they denied tenure because they said his work was too empirical. And like 10 years later, some of those same professors became billionaires by like investing in Google, right? So a yeah. little bit of a hypocrisy thing going. But the, the thing was that back in the 80s, the view was, you know, machine learning is interesting, but it's a really small part of the problem, like scheduling, getting robots to be smart about how they move in the real world, that's a hard problem. And now we're back at it. We have these issues of like self-driving cars. And and other drones and other things about robots not wanting to hurt people, um, and those are scheduling problems. And so they aren't machine learning problems in terms of supervised learning, but they can be addressed with things like reinforcement learning. And the interesting thing is, like you know, you read the papers about it, reinforcement learning. A lot of it is optimal control theory, and I mean that goes back decades. That goes back to like when you know back in the fifties when aircraft were falling apart midair when they learned how to build airframes in a more robust way and have control systems that, you know, that, so that's really what we're going back to now. And so I, I, I do think that um, in particular, reinforcement learning is interesting for real world, um, you know, especially like factory floor optimization, supply chain optimization. Um, I also think that knowledge graph is coming back a lot because a lot of what supervised machine learning has done is to decontextualize a problem. Like we take a whole bunch of data and we train, we learn, we generalize and we throw the data away. And so then we got this model and we don't really know why it's doing what it's doing. So now we've got a problem because we have to explain it to the auditors or you know whatever. Um, but the other thing is we've thrown away the context and knowledge graph is sort of orthogonal to machine learning in that it provides context. And really, uh, I was mentioning Lyft, uh, a really great example is uh, my, my friend Mark Grover is the product manager for an open source project called Adminson at Lyft. Uh, which is sort of knowledge graph, their answer to GDPR, but it's in support of their machine learning work. And they, they found that like doing the right thing for GDPR actually led to a lot of performance increase inside their company. Um, but they needed that knowledge graph to be able to augment it. They need to understand where does the data come from, where does it go to? 
So I see a lot of these kind of old school ideas coming back uh, it, it, to the fore. Yeah, uh, one of my buddies just gave a talk, uh, Hello Wayne, about if software engineers are really engineers. And like, I think a lot of these things that we're gonna be solving, they're gonna have to take the lessons from other fields and yeah. make software a little bit more, I, I guess like a harder type of thing. Cause like, there's so many ways to solve a problem and it's like, we need to standardize that in a way. Well, I mean, I, I I really think that like the my favorite use case of of machine learning is how can we make IDEs smarter? It's like I spend a lot of time writing code. I'm almost sixty and I write code every day. But, like I spend a lot of time like looking up little nits in some weird GitHub repo and then tracing down a bunch of Stack Overflow questions yeah. and finding out like out of the five Stack Overflow questions which one's actually valid and what answer still works after from ten years later. You know, that stuff, it, why do I have to do that? I could train models to do that. Yeah. I think there is uh, something on PyPI where it's like you can import Stack Overflow and like right. put something in and it like brings out like the top answer, which I think is amazing. Right, right. Yeah. Do you, uh, would you be able to provide links so we can share them out? Cause like you had a lot of things to uh, share. Absolutely. I can follow a lot of that um, up. The, most of the links of what I talked about like I say, um, Upcar had this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put this in the main chat. Um, talk. Cool. Uh, okay, so I I just put um, a link to a GitHub repo um, that um, uh, one of our other meetup was Upcar had done, um, and he sort of you know he he like pulled out all the links out of the talk and put them in one GitHub repo. So a lot of it is all right there. And also we're sharing the links, uh, I mean the slides, which have all the links in them. And there's a few repos that have different notebooks if you want to rerun some of the examples. Again, some of them might take like you know, 10, 20 minutes depending on your laptop. Um, so all of this stuff is meant to be really hands-on for everybody to go in and try themselves. Um, the big list that I had is linked in the slides. It's that Google spreadsheet doc that I've shared, um, but that, that's live for anybody to go in and check out and we'll keep curating that. Awesome, yeah, it's, it's always great to have like resources that are constantly being updated. So thank you for providing uh, these resources. Awesome. But before we uh, do let you go, do you have any calls to action for our community? Um, well, I will definitely say that, um, let, me, let me dig up one here. Um, you know, definitely the IBM uh, community. Let me go back to my slides here real quick. Uh, there's one last slide that I want to do as a call to action, and I'll sure. share screen real quick. Um, entire screen share. Um, and so this is current slide. Uh, here's an offer. Uh, the IBM data science community, I, I really love what's going on there. There's a lot of people from all over the world, um, especially, you know, it's not just the US, there's a lot of people from Europe and Asia and South America, et cetera. Um, and so it's kind of one-stop shopping if you have a problem and you want to compare notes with other people or get some good advice. Um, there's also a, a thing where they partner with Coursera. So you know, if you join the community, you can get free credits on Coursera for taking courses there. Um, and uh, I, again, we're trying to uh, have a lot of uh, different kinds of presentations. Um, AutoML is one that I've developed but there's others in terms of ML ops and fairness and bias and you know a lot of the kind of hot topics that we see these days in data science. Um, Will uh, Roberts and I have been doing a lot of writing together. Um, there's another article we just did about uh, visualizing geospatial data in Python, so looking at geopandas and, and uh, some of the libraries that go along with that. So you know we, we, we try to throw in a lot of, a lot of resources like this. So I highly recommend. Awesome, and yeah, just a shout out to uh, Tim at IBM for introducing us. Uh, it was a fantastic talk. Awesome. Uh, so thanks again for being on, and uh, we'll see you around. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. All right, so that was Paco Nathan talking about uh, introduction to AutoML. A lot of great content for uh, for us to go and explore. I'll just let me bring up my slides.
Cool. So I just want to thank our uh, our speakers tonight. So our first talk was about the recently relaunched Chippy Mentorship Program. This is called the Buddy Mentorship App. Uh, the talk was by Ben and Emily Shia Reinert. Uh, they talked about how uh, they built this website, which is chippymentor.org. So if you're looking to get involved and up your Python knowledge, up your data science knowledge, please get involved and uh, look forward to seeing you there. Uh, next up, we had Joel Gruss talking about 10 ways to fizzbuzz. And finally, we had Paco Nathan talking about introduction to AutoML. Can we just please get a round of applause in the chat for all of our speakers for the fantastic talks tonight? Uh, I do want to make some announcements of some upcoming events. Uh, next Wednesday is going to be our data special interest group event. Uh, we have our web dev slash DevOps event on August 4th. Our next algo sig is on Thursday, August 6th. And our next main meeting is going to be on Thursday, August 13th. And we have Piper Thernstrom, who is the lead designer of PP. Uh, Pursued Pi Bear, which is a game library that's a wrapper around Pi Game, a more Pythonic version of Pi Game, if you will. Uh, so yeah, just to dig into our data science talks, we got three fantastic talks focused in on time series. Uh, the first speaker is going to be speaking about Facebook profit and InfluxDB. The second talk is going to be on profit in production. And then finally, we have Sean Law, who is the creator of a new library for time series analysis called Stumpy. And we're gonna be going into an hour long deep dive. Uh, yeah, so we do have the Chippy Mentorship. Uh, go to chippymentorship.org, sign up. Uh, please sign up as a mentor. We always need mentors. Uh, also just wanna give a shout out to Lorena Mesa, Chippy community member, who's gonna be keynoting PyCon Africa. Uh, where can you find us? Uh, we have a very active Slack community. Check out this URL, send yourself an invite. Uh, we have rooms for everything from data science to web development to some fun rooms like for advent of code. Uh, we also have a Twitter account at Chicago Python and all this information plus a lot more is on our website. That's chippy.org. All right, well, that's it for tonight's presentations. If you're still around, be sure to go down there and hit that like button. It really helps us out. And we're also like, I think 70 or 80 subscribers away from a thousand. Uh, so help us get to a thousand subscribers, go down and hit that subscribe button. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time.